Okay, so good afternoon. And so today we are talking about uh, getting uh, into the business, talking about profitable, uh, uh, profitable growth, prof um, positive cash flow, which are the essentials for any business and using demonstrating really the theory behind the software that we're using uh, I was explaining uh, last meeting about getting under the skin of the business that we have to look into the driver so what we're going to talk about today is those little small increments that make such a big difference in the business you know sometimes we focus on trying to make a massive difference but actually it's those one percenters um, that really matter so we're going to look at uh, in particularly uh, when we're looking at measures, which ones um, are going to impact your future um, in terms of so that hopefully will influence your uh, results positively and which measures that traditionally we look at that uh, we can do nothing about because they were influenced by something in the past. So what we call the difference between lead and lag indicators. So I'm going to ask uh, Steve uh, to uh, present uh, this uh, session and I'll join in from time to time. And if anybody has got... Um, has, if anybody has actually got any questions and wants to butt in, please feel free to do so. So it's uh, um, no nobody's got a silly question. So uh, now the only thing I'll say to you is Steve might suddenly say, "Oh, I haven't seen this picture before," but uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't throw him. But let's uh, let's see what he says. So over to you, Steve. Okay, Mike. Let's put it into presenter mode. I think. Uh... Have I given you present uh, share um, screen share? I think so. I'm just clicking on your. Um... There we go. That's not not in presenter mode at the moment, is it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Was that you or was that me? Do you know? Um, I'm hoping we won't have the delay because if it's last time we did this, we had the delay between us. Um, so uh, try try to gain yourself. That's you, not me. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we talk about lead versus lag measures. Just a quick show of hands. Who knows the difference between a lead measure and a lag measure? Okay, I'll, I'll 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 resist the temptation to put anyone on the spot and tell us what the difference is. So, lead measures versus lag measures. You know, lead lead measures, lag measures. Most accountants will only report on lag measures, lag indicators. In other words, things that have already happened. So these are these are things that happen as the consequence of something else. And whereas a, a lead measure is the is the something that changes before the lag measures change. So lead indicators, lead measures, these, these will be the things that you ought to be tracking in the business. Um, because if you all you do is look at how much did I sell and what was my profit, well, it's too late to do anything about it. But typically lead measures are the things you need to be influencing to change the uh, behavior of the lag measures. And um, let me just pause with a quick question. So, you know, you know what do you want to get out of, out of today? And uh, so if we, if we aim for the stars, we might get to the moon. If we just aim for the moon, we might just about you know, get in, into the up to the space station, etc. So what, what would you like to get out of today? What's, what's an ideal result for you? You have to help me out on this one because I can't do this one for you. Uh, I'll answer for everybody. To, to, to understand um, the nuts and bolts of the business and what, what things we really should be measuring to be more effective in managing our businesses. Okay. Everybody happy to go with that? Fantastic. Okay. So um, I'll start by talking about um, something that might be a bit surprising. Let's talk about cycling. Um, and this is just a, an aid memoir to talk about the British Olympic um, cycling team. And I don't know whether you know this, but um, I think it was 2002. So David Brailsford took over the um, uh, English cycling to all the British cycling team and um, at that stage the team had, had won one gold medal in 67 years and if you take an analogy if that was if that was your business and you'd have one storming year in 67 years and bear with this one one just one medal not all of them um, yeah you, you might be tempted to give up the ghost and just you know, call it a, call it a day and, and not bother but uh, obviously the Olympics isn't quite like that. So you know, what actually happened in the case of um, David Brailsford and, and what he did with the team is uh, they went on to win the um, Beijing Malinkits. I think it was you, Mike, wasn't that? I didn't click anything there. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so the British um, team went to Beijing and won seven out of 10 gold medals. 
which if you think about the turnaround between 2002 and um, 2008, that's quite a spectacular change in, in performance after 67 years of, of no wins. They then went on to win um, you know, at, at most of the medals when they went to London in, 2000, in 2012. And then they went on to win four out of the next five Tour de, Tour de France um, competitions, uh, which is, is really quite a spectacular achievement. And, and how do they do it? Well, they just focused on breaking down all the things that went into making up um, you know, professional competitive cycling and started systematically looking for small incremental gains. So they didn't look for the big gain. They didn't look for the big change or the change in technology or take you know, you know, uh, drugs of um, high performance drugs. It was all about just identifying small things they could do to improve aggregate performance and those small things compounded over time. So taking that back into business and you can do the same thing in business. In fact, this is what you, know, you really need to be doing in business is you know, focusing on the things that would um, drive success. So looking for an optimum strategy, I've already mentioned um, lead and lag indicators. So you need to measure what matters because if you want to make small incremental changes, if you're not measuring the things that you need to um, understand, how do you know when the change you implemented to have the right or the wrong um, impact? So the lag indicators are outputs that um, uh, basically report on the reports after they've happened, whereas lead indicators uh, are the inputs and those lead in inputs, those are the things you need to measure uh, the activities that would drive the ultimate goals and the outputs. Um, if you did want to read more about that, that's, um, from a yeah, there's a lot more on that on the four disciplines of ex execution called 4DX. So key business drivers, you know, what are the key business drivers? Well, for most businesses, any business, it's it's the value, the average value per transaction, um, the frequency of purchase. So how frequently do clients actually purchase? How frequently could they purchase? The margin achieved on on each sale. The um, overhead to the business, the rate of customer acquisition, uh, leaving the best till last here, and the um, you know, rate of client retention. And whereas most people might, might, might track overall sales, very few businesses actually track the, the constituent of sales, which are those, those six. So look at those each one of these in, in, in detail. And um, you know, one of the things X5 can do is, is help you track this on a, on a granular basis, month by month, very, very quickly, very easily. So, yeah, question, yeah, do you know what your average transaction value is? Um, and if you, if you think about this one, once you know what your average transaction value is, the obvious next question is, well, what could you do to increase the value? And if you think about the, the you know, how do you change the value? You start thinking about the problem. The moment you start thinking about the problem and you start coming up with ideas, there will be things you could do and a lot of ideas that you'll come up with actually will cost nothing and can be implemented immediately. Um, so if you focus on doing things to increase the value and track the impact of those changes, you'll, um, you'll see whether you're having the desired or, or, or not the desired um, impact. Um, so just to food for thought, do you, do you offer bundles to increase um, sales and profit? So Edward, I, I, one, one that might work for you, I, had a, uh, I spent a brief spell as a consultant years and years ago. I suggested to a, um, a kitchen manufacturer who sold high-end bespoke kitchens that he might want to offer a um, a service for clients whereby someone would come along and just tighten up uh, all the fittings. Um, and, and, and part of that would be part of a, a maintenance contract. He sent out a letter. He got £8,000 in checks back in the post within, within two weeks. Really, really quick and easy way to up the, the value. And the real thing he wanted was to be, be in the right place at the right time when it came to putting in the new kitchen. Um, so bundles will increase sales and profit. Um, using upsell scripts. This, I think, is absolutely essential. And, and uh, if you're not sure what an upsell script is, we've all been on the receiving end of it, or just about everybody has. Is, do, do you want fries with that? Um, I don't know whether you know that, but McDonald's, every single McDonald's operator is supposed to ask the question, do you want fries with that? Um, and if you say yes, please, the fries, they'll ask you if you want to go large. And they reckon that contributes to about 40% of the profitability of McDonald's, that, those, those, those two questions, the upsell question huge increase in the profitability per transaction, um, as well as obviously increasing the actual transaction value. Um, and here's, here's a key one where uh, Mike and the team can um, almost certainly help is, you know, depending on your, your, your business and your nature of your interaction with your clients is, you know, 
many businesses have got more than one product or service. Uh, and if they haven't, maybe there, there's opportunities to increase the number of products and services. And then customers typically buy you know, what they wanted at the time they made their first transaction. And there are very frequently opportunities to sell you know, additional services to existing customers. Or put that another way, if you don't like talking about selling, uh, your clients have got other problems for which they're looking for a solution. And if you don't help them solve those problems, especially if they're part of what you do anyway, you've just missed the opportunity because the chances are, A, you'll miss the sale. B, they might actually end up going and buying that from somebody else. So don't think about selling. Think about servicing client need to deliver a more rounded, more complete solution and becoming more invaluable to your clients. Um, so key key issue here is, is, is please, please, please do track and record and review and talk about your average transaction value, ideally on a monthly basis, and then work to actually start pushing up and increasing your average transaction values. Moving on from transaction values, that's you know, the value, how about the frequency? And um, you know, for some businesses, you know, they only interact with their clients you know, once ever, uh, and there may be nothing you do about that. But in many, many cases, you know, there are other things you could do for the client. Uh, and there are ways of increasing the frequency of purchase. So a key key metric here is, you know, do we know the average number of purchases that, purchases that are being made? Um, so how often do customers purchase now? And once you understand that, you can start asking the questions about, well, how often could they purchase? And what could we do to influence the frequency of purchase? And again, a lot of the strategies are very, very easy. It's just talk to people, actually. Um, so how can you include, increase the frequency? And there's a key metric in there is, right, do you know how often your customers currently purchase and, and could we increase that, that number? Um, moving on from that, we could look at margin. And I think you'll find most uh, finance experts, the first thing they'll look at on a, on a profit and loss account is not the sales, it, it's the margin, and in particular, the margin rate. Um, it's a little bit to go into on, on margin. So yeah, do you know the margin you make on each sale? Um, and again, for, for a lot of businesses, if you're not correctly uh, categorizing your costs and dividing your cost into uh, fixed costs and um, marginal cost or variable cost, then the chances are that you won't have a clear understanding of margin. But you need to know the margin you make on each sale. Um, and you need to be tracking both gross and net margins. Um, and if you're not clear on what those two are, please, please, please speak to Mike and the team. Um, and that then prompts the next question, which is, which is again, best addressed by having the conversation with the, with the team as to what could we do to increase those, those gross margins. Um, and a key question here is, is, do you know the impact of discounting? A lot of businesses will discount to pick up business, especially when, when business is tight. Um, that is potentially catastrophic um, for a number of reasons. So key, key thing is, you need to be tracking gross margins. You know, doing it once a year, you know, six months after year end is just, just you know, is, is high risk in the extreme. So tracking and understanding gross and net margins on a regular that's basis. It. Just cutting in there, Steve, um, Edward, uh, that's like uh, you've been like a crack record. Edward and I have been uh, working hard and we're actually just reanalyzing figures. So to try and match um, the relevant income and expenditure, because um, we're introducing some project uh, uh, the projects in zero just to allow Edward to actually have make sure we clarify the margins by project uh, with the overall margins from the PL. So I, I can't agree more. It's it's just so important. And uh, um, I think even even though uh, Edward's got a very successful business, um, there's nothing like knowing the detail um, in terms of the project thing just to reassure you that nothing is slipping through. Um, because Edward said to me the other day, I hope you don't mind me saying Edward, but just one screw in uh, that he used can cost 50 quid. You know, so we think of screws as pennies, but you know, it's uh, some of these items are really expensive in terms of quality establishment. So you have to make sure you're tracking everything that goes into a project. So sorry, just butting in there. I think got to be a huge marketing story around a 50 pound screw. That's got to be worth a fortune for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of like stainless steel fixings because the green oaks really kind of... Um acidic so any kind of non-stainless fixing just gets rotten after a couple of years so yeah awesome I, I hope you say that loud and clear on your website right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably not enough actually <laughs> no, I, I, I suspect not. anyway yeah, yeah marketing is another story so let's just focus on this one so yeah I, I, 
I'm intrigued. I, lo I, lo I love, um, yeah, love tools, love working with wood as well. But um, discounting. So if you um, take a, a, a business that's not discounting, um, let's say it's you know, unit, unit cost um, or unit sales price, 100 pounds, cost of goods, 70, gross margin, 30, margin, 30%. Um, it's 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 all too frequent that um, you know some people will just ask for a discount every single time. I will always ask for a discount even when I don't want a discount. And and when you ask for a discount, the other party, do you know what? Nine times out of ten, they discount when they don't need to. Um, because honestly, typically ten percent makes no difference to whether I'm going to make the purchase decision or not. By the time I ask for the discount, I've already decided to make the purchase. Interesting point. I don't know whether everybody else is the same, but the yeah, it, it is easy to get a 10% discount because people can work out 10% in their heads. 10% of 100 is 10, 100 minus 10 is 90, so I can do that. If you ask me for a 7.5% discount, I have to reach for a calculator. But the impact on the gross margin, reducing it from 30 to 20, is is quite a profound uh, reduction. Um, and you know, conversely, actually, if you can push the price up by 10%, um, back to maybe the bundling, et cetera, and the, the, the McDonald's example, you know, just a 10% increase, which again, probably is not particularly instrumental in whether you, you win or don't win um, business, as long as you're selling on value rather than just on price, again, has quite a significant impact on the on the gross margin achieved. And if you map that into a business that's selling, you know, I've got a horrible feeling that the, these numbers don't quite tie up because uh, no, they don't look. So that should be 600, Mike. We need to make a change to that slide. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you're selling 600 units per month, um, yeah, you would be selling six hundred pounds worth of sales. If cost of goods are four twenty, gross margin one hundred and eighty, minus overhead one hundred and forty, we've got forty grand um, net profit. So seven percent is that good? Is that bad? Depends on the business, but yeah, at least it's a profit. Um, and if we uh, discount for that self same business, you notice that just a ten percent discount, just a ten percent discount moves that business from profit into loss. Um, Whereas conversely, if you manage to get the ten percent price rise, you can double the um, the profitability of the business. Just to keep hammering on um, and, and reinforcing the the importance of this because it is really really important. Um, if you look at the pricing table for a discount, if if you're running a business making a thirty percent gross margin, and an awful lot of businesses, certainly retailers, making gross margin, manufacturers are probably you know, more like fifty percent, and and software businesses are much 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 higher. But um, if you're running at a 30% gross margin and you reduce your price by 10%, what this table will look at is, is by how much do you have to increase sales just to stand still? And um, it's a bit of a shocker because the, the answer actually is you've actually got to increase sales by 50% just to stand still if you discount by 10% if you're running at a 30% margin. And I don't know about you, but I think in most cases, the idea of a business you know, decreasing prices by 10% to, to get a 50% increase in turnover, it's just not going to happen. That is a uh, yeah, yeah, question around price elasticity at that stage. But conversely, if we look at the, the pricing table for a, um, a pricing increase for the same business, um, anyone have a guess? Yeah, by how much could you reduce sales um, and still stand still? Shall I, shall I ease the ease the tension? Um, <laughs> it's actually up there. You could lose one out of every four customers. In other words, you could um, reduce sales by twenty five percent if you get priced up by ten percent, and you still make just as much profit. So, you know what that would hammer home is that if you put a ten percent price rise through and you lose some of your clients, it's highly unlikely that you're going to lose twenty five percent of your clients. You'd still be ahead, and logically, the clients you'd lose are those that don't really value you as a as a supplier anyway. So. The whole the whole margin issue is 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 very very key. Overheads is uh, is another interesting one. Um, I'll, I'll talk about utilities. So uh, I've got a good friend who used to run a a, a print business, and their their overheads. Uh, one of their overheads was uh, utilities, and they did what everybody else does, what I always used to do, which is every year I just take up what's my RPI, and I'll increase my overheads from last year by RPI, and I'll assume that's the right number for next year. Is that smart? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, in utilities, that wouldn't be a good move uh, for a number of reasons. So, you know, the question here: Are you using the best suppliers? And obviously, this this potentially applies as much to our 
suppliers of our um, you know, cost of goods as well as to our overheads, but are you using the best suppliers? And let's be honest, we don't know. And in some cases, some of the um, overhead expenditure isn't just a cost, it's a cost that's supposed to generate an ROI. So sales and marketing. Is your is, is investment in sales and marketing, does that generate an ROI? And if you're not measuring that, um, you know, how will you know whether you've got a good supplier or whether you're just throwing money down the drain unnecessarily? And again, Mike and the team can help you actually understand this in a lot more detail. Um, can operational efficiency be improved? I'll come back to that one. Just go back to are you using the best suppliers? You have any idea what the potential is to save money on utilities for an average business? Well, the, the answer is for most businesses, they can save between 40 and 60% on their energy bills. And, and the reason they don't do so is, well, the energy suppliers don't make it easy for a start. Um, and yeah, that's why 80% of the businesses just roll over their supplier from one year to the next without trying to make those savings. And back to my, uh, my, my publisher, the guy who used to print newspapers, yeah, they were spending about 1.4 million on, on energy. You know, what would a 60% well, reduction, of, you know, easy money there for the taking. So it's very easy to make some quick savings on the overheads. Um, point to note though, savings can only be made once, but it's worth reviewing your overheads on a, uh, at least an annual, if not a quarterly basis, just to identify opportunities to you know, trim the costs where necessary, because there's no point spending money uh, on overheads with that money could be redeployed to something more productive. And if it can't be redeployed for something more productive, well, you might as well pay yourself a bigger bonus. Um, so key, key, KPI there is just just measure the ROI on any expenditure which is uh, supposed to be generating a return. Um, moving on, looking at acquisition. Um, so this this is getting very close to my heart. So you know you can only make so many savings. Uh, you can work to improve your margins, but the only way to really grow a business is by increasing the uh, number of customers who are purchasing. So. Yeah, what key lead indicators should you be tracking with acquisition? And there are probably several. Um, key one is, you know, my, my rate of client acquisition. Uh, am I acquiring new clients? And is that rate of acquisition in, improving would be where I would be heading. And coming out of this, we'll be understanding lead sources. So if you're not tracking where your leads are coming from, the leads that convert into clients, you know, how can you identify where your best lead sources are? So you really ought to understand, you know, you know, not all leads are the same and not all lead sources are the same to identify the best sources of leads. And when you look at a, a client, you know, don't just, just look at um, the, the, the value of the first transaction. If you can keep a client and, and you, you have recurring income coming from that client, you know, what's the um, lifetime customer value of that client measured in profitability against you know, how much could you, should you invest in actually acquiring you know, good clients? Um, because not all needs, leads generate the same ROI. So there's a, there's a whole load of stuff that you really would be ideally understanding to make the best decisions as to what to do in terms of client acquisition. And in many cases, the best thing you do with client acquisition is stop doing whatever it is you're doing to generate lead sources. And the biggest culprit here is, 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 the, is the mighty Google. There is thousands and thousands of pounds thrown at lead generation strategies that you know, they just cost more than they generate by way of a return. Um, so, yeah, understanding and having a conversation with uh, Mike and his team about the lead indicators to track and looking at that ROI would lead you into identifying the best sources of new client acquisition and identifying additional sources of uh, client acquisition. Um, moving on to retention. Um, this, this is a, a, a real frightening statistic really is, is that um, the average rate of client attrition in the UK, the average rate of client attrition is 15 to 20%. And, and when you say it in those terms, it seems, oh, it's not too bad. So I'm keeping my clients for between five and, um, and seven years. That's, that's, that's good. But look at it another way around. You've got to replace your entire client base every five to seven years. Suddenly it seems like quite a shocker. So client retention actually probably is, is, is almost more important to focus on than uh, client acquisition because there's, there's even more comes out of um, retention when you think about this is, you know, you know, selling to existing clients or retaining existing clients. You know, selling something to an existing client costs you four times less than selling to a new client. Um, and so this, this really ought to be focused on. So clearly there is, is 
you know, do you know your current attrition rate? Because if you're not tracking customer attrition, and again, I think they, right, I think I'm right in saying the, the simplest report that um, X5 deliver, you will track and report on client attrition and client acquisition every single month. Absolutely. That's yeah, because we, we're looking at uh, as providing the uh, transactions are posted um, to customers by invoice, and we then we can actually see what customers are active and are not active. So hugely valuable just knowing your current attrition rate because then then you then you can start to work on you know well what can we do to improve um, client retention opposite of um, attrition of course um, so the first thing I would suggest is well do you have an effective feedback process and uh, anybody who thinks they've got a feedback process if they're relying on TripAdvisor or Checker Trade or one of these electronic uh, feedback processes you know please don't believe you know the truth if you're just looking at that, because what you'll find is you're only gonna get feedback from the polarized extremes of opinion. In other words, the very, very happy will respond, the very, very unhappy will respond, and everybody in the middle, which are probably the ones that really matter, doesn't respond. And you might have some issues in there where clients are not happy, not telling you, uh, and that's adversely affecting your ability to persuade them to buy more, uh, to buy more frequently, and to ultimately stick around. Um, and having an engagement strategy, I'm going to pick on accountants for a second. So yeah, the they, 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 um, yeah, the, the picture of, of a typical accountant is someone who, from the business owner's point of view, you don't hear from them from one year to the next. And when you do, you sit down and talk to them about what happened you know, six to nine months after the year end as you do a year end um, set of accounts. Uh, whereas, you know, if you can have an engaged relationship, you don't have an engaged relationship with someone you only meet once a year and you talk to once a year. So ideally have a strategy to interact with your client in some way, shape or form on a more regular basis. So yeah, here we are on an example of that. So you know, X5 are providing an interaction with clients and ability to offer value for clients on a regular basis using these workshops. So what strategies could you have in your business to interact with clients more frequently? And you're not necessarily looking for just um, you know, selling more to them. You're just looking to develop the relationship to improve the satisfaction, improve retention. So when there's an opportunity to make a make a sale, you you've got a better chance. But it's also an integral part of the referral strategy. Because if you don't interact on a regular basis and remind clients of the value you're delivering, you're less likely to get the referrals you might otherwise get, especially if you are you're know, going to proactively ask for referrals. Um, so do you know your current attrition rate? We've, we've come out of that one, and that's the one to track on a regular basis. And as I said, Mike and the team are reporting on it on a regular basis. Um, and, and that's in, in this report, basically. So one of the reports that um, yeah, X5 delivers is the uh, business overview report. And the first thing it does is look at the sales, and it breaks down the sales and look at the number of transactions. So here's a business that's um, you know enjoyed just counting number of transactions, 4,360 transactions in the last 12 months. And that's um, an increase on the previous 12 months, uh, hence the green tick. So the, the impact of the increase in transactions had a positive impact on turnover to the tune of 50.3K, all other things being equal, so just taking averages. Same business, however, has allowed its average transaction value to slide very slightly. Um, so it's not a huge movement. It's gone from you know 240 down to 230 pounds. So you know one wouldn't expect that to have a massive impact. But you know the shocker here that's 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 offset all the gains through selling more, uh, reducing them from you know down by 52k. All other things being equal. So yeah, this particular business has seen sales slide um, or flat lining from a million and three to a million and one. Um, that's the output almost. Um, what about the input drivers? So key input drivers here is, you know, what's going to influence the number of transactions? Well, that's going to be driven predominantly by the number of customers. What's going to drive the number of customers? Well, there's a couple of drivers here. There's however many customers you had last year, you know, expectation is, you know, some of them, most of them are going to buy next year. Plus, you know, how many new customers did you acquire and how many would you expect to acquire next year. So here's a business that uh, the trend, underlying trend on customer um, uh, acquisition has gone down from 98 clients acquired in the last 12 months down to 79 clients acquired in the, in the most recent period. So yeah, the difference between those two is, is actually quite a big number. 
um, what we're looking at here is 19 fewer customers. Average, 19 fewer customers, the impact on turnover for this particular business would be about 108,000 pounds. In other words, 11% of turnover. Um, one could speculate that that would appear to be a trend of being less effective of acquiring clients. This isn't necessarily the whole story because it could be that these 79 clients are massively better value than the 98. So just the absolute number alone is not enough. So there's more analysis to you know, un uncover that one. But you know, one might speculate that we dropped by nearly 20 from 100 down to about 80. What's next year going to be? Is it going to be 60? Um, and then take that in the round with uh, the other part of this one is that what about our retention rate? Because this business retained 55% of its clients two years ago, but only managed to retain 51% of its clients in the most recent 12 months. So the reduction there of, okay, it's only four and a bit percent. Um, however, the 4.2% fewer customers year on year has potentially impacted this company to the tune of 44K. So we've got a number of, of, of lead indicators and, and, and you know, core data there that we could focus on so if you have the, the red ones up, you've got nearly 200,000 pounds. 200,000 pounds on a business turning over a million is, is a big number, 20% of turnover. Uh, and we now know where we should focus. The key thing is we now know where we should focus and we can do some specific things around improving retention, around improving the number of customers acquired uh, and about, you know, well, put the prices up where you're quick and easy way of getting your price back. Um, any questions on that? Okay. I make an observation. I think this is one of the things I always say to our team is that uh, we're only as good as the data we um, allow our clients to post to the computers. So, and there's always a temptation just to have sales. Um, and so, the more analysis we can have in the in a computer system, the better it is. Even if we consolidate those figures into uh, grouped figures or one figure, as long as we've got the analysis behind the scenes, then we can actually delve down to actually produce this sort of information because this information is gold dust to um, a lot of businesses i mean in some way like uh, edward's business where you may maybe talking about um, fewer uh, repeat customers but you've got uh, somebody who um, buys a garage might well buy a pergola because they're so delighted might well buy a porch um, the next day so they they can definitely be repeat customers but it's not the same as somebody who's um, selling a selling stuff that the people keep coming back to the shop or keep coming back online to buy. But whatever it is, it allows you to actually have a, a delve down deep into what is the information, what's it telling us, what is the impact if um, if it continues in that sort of ratio and in that trend. I think it's um, you can't uh, underestimate the power of having this sort of analysis. No, I information is power, as they say. Um, okay. So retention and acquisition. Um, actually, Mike, I can't do it from my end on this one. Is it worth just running through the business growth model? Have you got that to hand? Um, I, I have behind the scenes. It's probably, we probably won't have the time to go through it, Steve, uh, on this. Okay. I think so, we'll go through the business growth model next week. Okay, no, no problem. So this is a business. So this is just looking at, um, you know, a, a particular business, the same business as we had the numbers for before. So, you see the, the new customer growth, it's quite small on the screen there. So new customer growth year on year is running at minus 19.4%. If this business continues to do what it's doing, then it's reasonable to assume that that will continue to uh, decline at the same rate. So if we just continue and repeat last year's performance in trend terms. Um, you'd see a reduction in the number of customers uh, and you'd also see a reduction in the number of customers retained. And if you map that through uh, and look at those two figures up there, so take that off again. Yeah, that would see that the number of customers acquired each year would reduce potentially um, quite significantly uh, because we're also losing customers. So there's lost customers coming through here. Um, you'd see the absolute number of customers potentially catastrophically reducing uh, impact therefore on sales. Um, well, they're gonna, they're gonna divide you know, massively down to a quarter and the impact on the business where well, there's no point talking about year five because there'll hardly be a year three. That would be catastrophic potentially. Uh, I know you're not seeing the figures, but this particular business actually made good uh, good profits last year. So we look at another scenario. Then you know, if this business could just repeat um, its performance in absolute terms, so yeah, you know, they they their new customer growth 
trends flatten out the trend so it's just the same amount of customers acquired each year 0% and the same number of customers retained each year flattening out the trend then this business would have you know 79 customers per year being added to the client base there's my existing client base however I've also got to factor in my customers being lost so whereas I might be picking up 79 new clients um, it looks like I'm going to be losing 86 so I'm actually going backwards uh, so even even if I just repeat what I did last year, my number of customers is reducing year on year. And um, if you map that through, then in effect, um, uh, animation slightly out of um, sync. So yeah, even in that case, we, st we we are making a profit, but the the profit let's go on one profit reduce here from from 80k made last year down to 53. So you know serious reduction in the amount that the, the this business owner will be able to pay themselves out of the business. And and the point to note is that you know this, this this has to be considered this is what's going to happen if you don't do anything probably um so you have to do something to actually improve the situation so whilst you're improving it why just stop at getting back to where we did last or what we did last year you might as well carry on and see if we can get back to a slight growth curve and the growth curve is just you know can we get to the point where we've got a slight improvement in the rate of customer acquisition each year you know, can we slightly improve the rate of customer retention each year? And you only know of that if you're measuring the statistics to actually make sure you're on track. And you'll see what this will do for the business is by 79 customers goes up to, yeah, I pick up 87 new customers, sorry, 175, pick up 87 new customers up from 79, then 87 to 96 to 105. So not huge jumps and slight improvement in the rate of customer ret retention. Then that just improves the total customer base yeah, yeah, quite substantially. And this is only looking at two KPIs, looking at the retention KPI and the acquisition KPI. And uh, the impact on this business is, is, is superb. The, the sales and hence the profitability, uh, in this case, go through the roof. So we're going up from 80K to 480K. Um, so, okay, that's hypothetical. It's all about the future, but that, that would appear to be quite an achievable target for this particular business. Um, so those those are those are you know six key business drivers that I would strongly recommend that you you have a good handle on and review uh, and look for strategies to improve on a uh, monthly basis. I think it's it's really important just to echo what Steve said. We have a motor dealer, uh, a, a garage, um, so not really a motor dealer, although they'll sell secondhand cars, but they have got repeat customers and they haven't got a clue. Um, what their sales are they really just know what's in their bank so they don't know what they owe what they um, what uh, what number of customers what the average transaction value is because they're so busy just doing it and so this sort of information we're having a devil's own job in this case actually trying to get them onto a decent computer system because previously they just had spreadsheets and uh, it's uh, when you sort of see this sort of information how much value this would have to somebody that would repeat customers, uh, repeat repeat transactions in terms of uh, services, repairs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, could transform the business where the guy is working himself silly trying to go through a business. So we tend to sort of think about this side of thing for just for big businesses, but it's really relevant just to small as to small businesses as it is to big businesses. That's a very good point, Mike. Uh, it's my experience as well is that very very few people actually have a handle on their numbers. Um, so recommendation, um, yeah, please do take time to identify your lead indicators and, and emphasize your lead indicators because, you know, s some of the uh, financial indicators are universal, but every single business is different. Um, having worked out exactly what they are is, you know, cr create a forecast, financial forecast, um, and start to track uh, your actual performance month on month. Uh, against a, a monthly forecast and by, by tracking where you'd like your lead indicators to move to what you'll see in your uh, forecast will be the you know, the impact of those improvements over time um, and it, it's amazing the extent to which you know small improvements over time compound to deliver a massive impact on the bottom line um, and, and this is how uh, you know Mike and the team can help you um, if you go down to the basics, you know, coming up from um, an engagement whereby we've just got a, a compliance service or, or you know, relationship with accountant is I'm just doing year end compliance reporting for you know, submissions to Companies House and HMRC. 
you know, timely analysis and reporting. Um, so, you know, much easier if you've got the right accounting package and we can then uh, output, you know, financial and other key performance indicators. Um, move that up to, you know, proper management account. So, you know, reporting actual versus forecast. Um, looks like a small little sentence, actual versus forecast. Actually, it's quite a major thing. If we haven't got a forecast, um, you haven't got a plan. If you haven't got a plan, how do you know where you're going? So, you know, ideally, we would be tracking performance against forecast and tracking the um, behavior of those, those lead indicators. Going one step further, um, you know, being uh, on hand, not only just to you know, you know, give you, here's the data, off you go, but actually, you know, understanding what that financial information is telling you and understanding its true impact on the on the business and addressing any questions and, you know, reviewing and discussing, well, what do we can do? How can we do? What can we do to actually, you know, improve the KPIs and improve the results for the business? And just discussing and asking, you know, you know pertinent good questions to help, you know, focus attention on the right things and things that matter. Um, ultimately, moving that into making better decisions and having made better decisions and more timely decisions, actually, you know, systematically quantifying the impact of those decisions to make sure it's delivering the right outcome. And if it's working, great, keep doing it. And if it's not, well, very quickly um, stop doing it um, and, you know, you know re regroup and focus again, to try and find the next activity which will deliver what you really need. And ultimately, you know, just reviewing the impacts of changes and measuring and reporting on the uh, overall you know, return on investment of what you're doing to deliver the outcome and, and tracking you through the process. So any and all of those levels of interaction are, are ways in which um, X5 can help you through you know, reporting through to part-time um, FD services. I mean, Mike, is there anything I, you'd add to that? Yeah, I mean, if I could, um, if I had the courage to do so, I'd get away, um, uh, avoid the use of the word accounts and accountants, because I think now this is all about financial information or relevant financial information. But the trouble is, if you dispense with the word accounts, you know, people will um, just they, they will associate certain, certain words with certain things. But accounts are historical. And uh, so what was Steve was talking about lag indicators, you can do nothing about it when you by the time you look at accounts, it's all happened. You, you, all you can do is learn from it to say, well, let's try and if it was a bad picture, let's try and make sure that doesn't happen again. If you look at it, financial information and say, right, OK, look at stuff that is a, in a trend and say, oh, this trend's not going the right way. And the figures in the absolute figures look quite good. But if we're actually losing the number of customers and we're, our average transaction value is going down, um, or there's other indicators that are relevant, for example, customer, customer satisfaction measures or whatever it could be, um, there's uh, things that we need to measure which are relevant financial information to allow us to make the right decisions at the right time. So I can't, yeah, I can't agree uh, enough with you, Steve. This is so important, making better decisions um and review review your decisions on a quarterly basis so because i think monthly is difficult to do so but on a quarterly you can compare trends and just say right we anticipated something to have happened if it's not happening is it because what we anticipated was wrong or we're not implementing properly and then it is quite possible that everything we've spoken about here well it's, it's definitely uh, probable actually everything we're speaking about here it's, it's not a cost it's an investment and definitely the cost of an investment an investment gives you an ROI. So, you know, by, by outsourcing as much as possible of your financial management function um, as possible to X5, X5 can probably do it better, faster, and ultimately cheaper than you would have done it yourself. Um, whilst you focus on doing what you really do, which is, which is actually creating value and uh, making the profit. Um, so moving on, if I put that another way, um, you know, have a forecast, have a plan. Obviously, X5 can help you put together your forecast and build out your plan and detailed, you know, five-year, three-way forecast, which means you, you've got a plan. It won't go according to plan, but if you've got a plan, at least you know where you are and you can you can respond accordingly. Your plan I will think, ideally... I think a lot of our team on the call will actually recognise that so few of our clients have actually got a plan. So you'd think most people would have a plan, but so few actually have because we're so busy actually just dealing with the um, daily routine of business that people forget to actually say, well, let's actually give ourselves some milestones against which we can compare our progress. Absolutely. There's, um, is it, is it um, Alice in Wonderland where you got the um, Alice asks, how do I get from, you know, which way should I go? Yeah. 
Yes, depends where you. Yeah, no, where, yeah, but how long would it take me to get there? It depends where you want to go or something like that. Yeah. Is it well? Which, which path should I take? Well, it depends where you want to go. So I don't know. It doesn't matter then. <laughs> um. So anyway, so your your plan should include, um, and and never more important than now, the cash flow forecast. Uh, analyze it and report it on a regular basis. If if capital is needed, uh, either either for growth or, or just for working capital with the current situation, you know you need a forecast and a plan in order to make sure you raise enough capital, and actually to support the the, the funding application. Um, it, it helps you um, identify and, and, and address and realize opportunities and address threats. Um, and obviously the, the kill basis without the plan, you, you can't report actual performance versus forecast. Um, and I, I, to my mind, I, I don't know how you can manage a business effectively unless you're actually reporting uh, actual performance on a regular basis against forecast. Personal view, quarterly is just too dangerous. You need to do it monthly because things can happen very fast in business. Uh, and when when you're in a bad place, you know, things take a lot longer to resolve uh, than when you're in a good place. And most of all, um, you know, this, this will help you achieve your goals. So, you know, what might that be? Well, if you wanted to exit the business in period, say five years, and in order to do to exit on on your terms, when the way you want to, you wanted to um, exit with an exit valuation of about 1.5 million. If your forecast and your plan based on an extrapolation of current performance generates or indicates that you might have a business worth 500,000, you've got a 1 million shortfall on what you need to achieve your goals. Now that, that has a whole load of very, very nasty ramifications. Um, and if you don't realize it until it's time to retire and suddenly realize you're about a million short, well, you ain't retiring and, and you might not have the option. So it, this helps you actually get to your goals um, sooner and know that you're on your way. So I can't emphasize how important that is. Um, so your forecast and your plan helps you achieve your goals. Um, can, I just, can I just interject there, Steve? It's another example live today. Um, you know, aware that last night we were um, getting some analysis um, of the um, the business growth plan, and uh, for a client that uh, one of my colleagues was seeing this morning. Well, he went through with the uh, my colleague and went through the figures, and the client had just had no idea how profitable he was going to be in three or four years' time. Uh, just based on certain certain assumptions, and he's just about w ready to accept um, four million pounds for his business, and uh, is now realizing actually his business is probably worth double that. And so, just by looking at uh, those figures, um, it suddenly made him realize when you're talking about achieving your goals, um, he was just saying, "Well, I'm I'm getting on a bit. Um, I really um, need to get a decent sum of money, but." he was looking at uh, historical figures in coming up with that. And he wasn't, uh, you'd think he'd be saying, well, I'm getting these contracts, I'm getting that contract. But because it was actually put down um, on paper using this software and say, let's have a discussion about this. Let's see whether this is actually relevant. Is this true? Just using these certain assumptions. And if we, if we tweet your average value by this, and if we tweet your average retention and your average repeat visit, um, how much impact will that have? And he just couldn't believe he couldn't believe in front of his eyes the impact it would have on his profitability. Or is it fair to say, Mike, it was only when he saw it in front of his eyes did it start to dawn on him the full ramifications of the impact on the profitability and how exactly. erroneous it would have been to a sellout at four million when he was actually worth eight in three years' time. Um, what was interesting, and for for my team on the call, um, when you send something on the over the uh, into over the let's say online send it to them to read or send it on paper is a whole load of figures means nothing the actual power was actually looking through this and having a conversation about what was included and so suddenly the client said my god it's staring me in the face but i needed you to point it out to me and so it to me it was music to hear to hear that because uh, we were working at nine o'clock last night to uh, um, just produce this analysis and understand why the figures were looking so good and uh, um, so at nine o'clock this morning when they have the meeting I was able to look at this simple simple information it is very simple but actually has um, astonishing impact so can you do the same for Edward Mike L luckily Edward's not ready to is he selling he's growing so uh... <laughs> no no I just I mean increase the value Edward of the business I... by three million in the next three years oh yeah Edward and, Ed Edward and I are working very closely together so we are uh, 
we are looking at this and uh, that's why Edward's uh, attending this uh, um, session today. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, you know, free advice and support. So, you know, the, the one thing I think you've, you've clearly already doing this with Edward. So, you know, I think this is an offer that's open for any business. So, you know, if you know of any businesses that don't really understand their financial position, don't understand what they could potentially be worth in three years time with small tweaks to the lead indicators, you know, please, please broker an introduction and um, Mike and the team will be very, very happy to analyze the data, um, identify any risks and uh, most importantly, opportunities for growth. Um, so this is one of a number of um, different workshops. So the, the idea of this is it's not just workshops for the sake of workshops. So the, the, the hope and expectation is by attending the workshops and more to the point, you know, paying attention and, and taking action as a result of, um, you know, what we've gone through. Even, even if you only implement one or two things, it can't help but have a profound impact on the on the bottom line because over time these things will improve. So this covers, you know, most of the aspects of well, all the aspects of running a business, certainly from the the, the, the key drivers point of view. Um, so a parting thought, um, a budget, even when you have one, is telling you where your money, um, no, telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'd much rather you know drive my money somewhere rather than just wake up and wonder where it was, especially if I was looking at retiring at some point and realised I didn't have the money I needed. Um, so any questions? Kevin, um, as uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, any thoughts uh, from this? Yeah, no, I thought it was very good. Um, I think these are a common um, issues that we find with a lot of clients, and often the difficulty is getting them just to focus and sit back for the business long enough to actually ask the question. So I think that's very helpful. Absolutely. And I think I'm going to try and encourage some more of my clients to come on this. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it's true because it to realize, I mean, it's, what we're talking about is actually relatively simple, but trouble is it's not easy to extract the information um, if it's not posted properly in the first place. And then it, um, if it is posted properly, you still have to extract it. And traditionally, what we'd have to do is export it to loads of spreadsheets and then analyze what uh, Steve is now helping us to do is to use the power of uh, software to actually do a lot of the uh, hard work for us so that we can concentrate on interpreting it. Yeah, I mean, we were involved in asking similar questions many years ago, but it was a very cumbersome process, as you say. So we'd have to get the books, we'd have to extract it all, put it on spreadsheets, play around, and it was, but now we've got, it's all at our fingertips. If you're using something like Zero, most yeah. of the information's there anyway before you start. So it makes it so much easier to really sort of drill down and focus on the different um, aspects you need to really look at, you know? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, basically you're straight into delivering value and having a conversation rather than having to, you know, put a, a, a potentially price prohibited price to do the research to get to the point of starting the value add conversation. Mm. No, that was yeah, I mean, historically, we did make similar attempts, but it was it was much more difficult back then. Yeah. Edward, any observations? I mean, it's this is tying in with our conversations we've been having, but uh, any other observations? Um, I think it's all about setting the data up, isn't it, really? Absolutely. Uh, making sure it's in the right place to be able to use it, because, yeah, the, the rest of the stuff will be able to kind of effectively use that data yeah. to be able to have yeah. multiples on whatever you do make complete sense and I think the it's really about catching that kind of you know where's the low-hanging fruit because also eventually you know if you're looking at this data you can find loads of different things you can do to improve improve things or it's a customer acquisition and stuff like that yes and then you know it's finding the time to address them one by one <laughs> Exactly. That's that. You're exactly right. That's why I say I, I think I'd rather call it financial information than accounts, because it's exactly there is just so much information here. Yeah. And then it's just a question of prioritizing. So, Edward, Kevin, um, Sharon, Monica, Mike, can I can I make my excuses and just duck out? I've got to be on another call. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. That's my pleasure. Okay. Cheers all. Bye. Okay, so that that was the whole idea is to um, for us to share, um, get get a feel for the um, background to this analysis. So I stop sharing that screen now. Um, Siobhan, any any thoughts from you? Um, I thought you might uh, the idea about the um, the motor mechanic and the thing you uh, you know who I was talking about. So. Uh, 
I did wonder, um, and yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I think if you can pin him down long enough to sit down and look at something like that, I think you'd find it very, very useful. Um, yeah. I think, you know, he's, he's, he's got the right attitude. It's just him being able to get off the tools and, uh, you know, work with the figures and, and get better things implemented and structures in place. So, yeah. you know, it gives him a bit of breathing space. But, you know, I thought it was really interesting. Great. I think most businesses, Siobhan, the, the owners of the business are at their most comfortable doing the thing the business does. And to try and get them to stand back and look at the business is often the, the hardest step of all, I think. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. As, unless anybody's got any questions, let's uh, crack on and get on with whatever we've got, we've got to do next. Um, thank you very much for attending. Hope it was useful to you. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Mike. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.